Welcome to EdTech Weekly, episode 209. This is February 26th and 27th, 2012, and this is John Schenker in Stowe, Ohio. This is Dave Cormier in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, joined by special guest today. Drew McAllister in Yay. St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, Drew. <laughs> hey. Thanks, guys. And we actually Drew McAllister. Have a, we have a topic today. Well, first, Drew, tell us who you are and what you do and and give us some background on on you all right um, Drew McAllister um, and I am a technology integration specialist for a school district in st. Louis Missouri and um, uh, what I do is I work in two buildings as uh, instructional technology support to teachers and students um, talking with them about a number of different technologies and how it can uh, interplay with uh, learning and um, instructional design. And um, in addition to my in-building role, I also work as a liaison and consultant to curriculum areas. We have a fairly, um, I guess, a me medium-sized district, uh, five high schools and uh, five middle schools and a number of elementary schools. Um, and so I work with the foreign language and ESOL coordinator uh, as well as our fine arts coordinator to um, infuse technology uh, and um, technology-friendly approaches into their curriculum uh, as they as they write it along with teachers. So um, I've been doing this for almost five years, and it's been a great experience. I'm always curious how people wind up being a technology integration specialist. Is this something you had <laughs> dreamt of in your youth? Um, the way that it worked for me was uh, I actually taught Latin of all subjects. Um, in uh, the middle school and, and high school where I became this specialist position. Um, I had done a few things with um, audio recordings, posting online, um, some projects, and had been actually inspired by, by my library media specialist to do so. Um, and so I um, began, um, I had to, you know, it's a teacher job, and so you move up the channel by um, adding to your professional um, certifications. And so what I said was, you know, I have a master's, now I'm going to do a little bit more work um, to uh, move up the, the pay scale, and so I decided to pursue a degree in library media, um, in, in, in library media, and um, because I just really enjoyed the collaborative work that I'd done with my media specialist, um, around about the time that I began doing that uh, that work and uh, doing some of these projects with kids, they opened up this technology integration specialist position, and so um, I interviewed and uh, and they took me. And so I began uh, furious on the job training <laughs> from uh, from then on. So um, it's been it's been great. And you, you come to the show with a topic and coherent, prepared thoughts. I'm wondering if before we dive into that, it's been so long since we've done a show. Anybody want to say, hey, how you doing, John, Dave? How's your hey. year going so far? How you doing? Things are fantastic, Jeff. Thank you for asking. How are you? I am fine, thank you. <laughs> but Dave, you're you're looking different. You're you're futzing around, making all sorts of noises over there. What's uh, what's this is looking new and different? What's new and different in your world? Well, I mean, this year I'm trying very much to um, to to get a little bit more focused on my own work and try to get the whole rhizome stuff pulled together. It became very clear at the end of last year both that the the rhizome thing. Um, and the how it applied to education was interesting to some people and also that I had not put nearly enough thought into it as uh, <clears throat> the ver variety of cross-examinations made perfectly clear. So uh, a lot of my work this year uh, is about that and pretty much all of my presentations that I'm doing this year are all sort of about my research instead of more broadly, which is what I've generally done. Um, sort of just trying to focus a little bit more and, and try to stay on that task and you know maybe it means that by the end of this year I finish that up I wrap it up and I never talk about it again or maybe it means I finish a book I, it's hard to say <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it means you start a book that's probably yeah. more likely yeah well actually you're talking about all of your presentations this year being centered around uh, rhizomatic education. I actually took a year off. I'm in halfway through a year off from presenting. So I had decided kind of last summer that really what's happening in my schools right now was has not been particularly innovative over the last couple of years. And so I, I felt like 
uh, it was a bit inauthentic for me to be up and talking about all the cool innovative things that are going on. So I had just kind of stopped and, and stepped back and said, you know what, I'm going to go to conferences this year and listen to other people and not worry about um, what I have to say or what I bring to the table. And that's been a very liberating experience just to be able to to talk to other people and look at different perspectives and and uh, actually have some things that are, are coming up that are going to be uh, worth talking about. So I'm looking forward to that. And I don't do presentations. I just have the same to-do list every year and just try to do it. <laughs> uh, do, do, do you do presentations? Are you on the conference circuit at all? Um, well, not not uh, not the circuit by by any means. Um, I do a few presentations in a regional conference that happens here, uh, the Midwest Educational Technology Conference (METC). Um, do a couple of presentations there every year, um, and just recently, I've been working with um, a few foreign language educators, um, and so we've been uh, talking with uh, primarily people within Missouri about um, making sure that we are thinking in terms of global collaboration, um, students to uh, work with one another um, on projects and, and uh, speaking, listening, and, um, and writing, um, not just for the people in their class, but um, for people outside of, outside of their borders. So um, I'm, I'm not a, a circuit person by any means, but uh, I enjoy doing the presentation. What was the title of your last presentation? <laughs> Let's see. Um, I did three uh, this past METC, and so I did one on um, practical applications of blended learning using Moodle, which is our learning uh, platform uh, in, a, in my school district. Um, it was really more, I like to tell stories more than I like to uh, preach, so, um, so that's what I did. We, uh, we talked a lot about how uh, our teachers are using Moodle and the, the great things they're doing. Um, I also did one. Um, that was all about the NETS standards. And so um, we had a, a round table type situation. Um, so I was in charge of standard four. Um, so I called that one um, how not to deliver a report. Um, and then we also did, I did one with um, an educator, um, Morel Jones, who comes from uh, just north of Kansas City. Um, USA Mimi 74 is her Twitter handle. Um, she's a uh, an active uh, Twitter uh, person with, with languages and uh, a French teacher up there. Uh, we did one that was a, kind of a, a discussion format um, for just foreign language teachers um, towards the end of the day. So um, that's, right. that's what I did. What, what is a good Latin saying or segue for, and let us address the topic at hand. <laughs> um, it's been four and a half years since I taught that. <laughs> So I'm not going to pull that out or try right. um, at this point. But let's do the topic at hand then. All right. What is it? Um, well, I've come to you guys with uh, a question. And for anyone else who is uh, in the chat room or streaming um, or who stumbles upon this later on, I'd, I'm always up for ideas. Um, and the topic is, what are the big themes in educational technology? Um, my current position uh, as a technology integration specialist, uh, due to bu budget cuts, um, we have uh, that uh, it's a full-time position, and the district has decided that um, they really can't support that full-time position any longer. So what they're doing is uh, going with more of a generalized model of PD, creating instructional coach positions for um, kindergarten to eighth grade. Um, buildings and that person will be in charge of um, data as well as tech integration as well as um, literacy, literacy strategies um, but a, a good bulk of this work will also be diverted to um, our library media specialists as well as technical support personnel that uh, it does have um, full-time or half-time duties within within the building so um, since the knowledge will be spread over so many different people um, I really wanted to make a concerted effort to try to synthesize all the different things that I've learned over the last five years so that I can uh, I can't really create a handout but um, but I can I can facilitate a discussion with each one of these parties that will be taking up some of this work um, 
so that the transition is seamless, so that uh, support for the big ideas still is present for teachers. And um, I still have three months, so I have some time to train um, teacher leaders on these topics as well. Um, and so I sent Jeff an email um, thinking, well, uh, I've been listening to uh, EdTech Weekly for a number of years now, and I've always appreciated the opinions that you guys give, um, and, and Jen, when she's able to come. Um, and so I thought, well, I'd, I'd throw it out and uh, see what you all do with it. I've written a blog post, and, um, and I think it's, that's in the chat. Um, and it's also uh, a version of it is on a Google Doc. So uh, anyone who is listening can uh, pop in and start adding comments um, directly onto the, the things that I've thought about, um, but I'm not wedded to those at all. Think of it as a first draft. So thanks, guys. And I read that email and I thought, well, I bet John and Dave and Jen, if she's available, will have smart sounding things to say about all that. Uh, so what do we want to do? Do we want to kind of go through what you've, you've got so far? Gentlemen, are you eager to chime in? I wrote down some uh, notes and then realized that someone had already written a blog post about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are fully prepared to do a lot of nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I guess first of all, I, I think it's admirable that you're doing this at all. That, you know, and and I don't know what your relationship is with your school district, but it sounds like it's a pretty good one. But but to actually be thinking about, hey, I'm not going to be here next year, and I want some of this stuff that we've been doing to continue, and I also want them to to actually build on that and do more even though they're going to have fewer people and I'm going to try to lay the groundwork to make that happen even though I'm not going to be part of the equation. I think that's great as opposed to I think a lot of people in your situation would be treading water at this point and you know focusing on on maybe building your own credentials and doing the job search thing and you know just trying to to tie up loose ends uh but but it's great that you're you're forward thinking and trying to to better the school um i, I think that's admirable thanks um i can't say and enough I cut off things. dave <laughs> sorry I'll, I'll let i'll let you go ahead dave. Respond, respond to that um uh i've had i can't say enough good things about the district for which i work um and the the people there um i i began my teaching career there and um I, I know how passionate these educators are. So, um, yeah, thanks. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I, I think this is a really nice list. And to go directly to the blog post, I did get a chance to read it earlier, and I'm sort of going through it again now, which is why I've got this distracted looking off into the distance look here. <laughs> I think. That's you're going to tell me that's what I look like all the time, John? Oh, uh, no, go you're on. save that. Go on. Save I'm going to be nice uh, to you because I haven't talked to you in a month. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, when I look at this more broadly and I look at the specific stuff in here, what I'm, what I'm looking for are the overarching themes that tie all this together. The things that – this is a list, I think, that if somebody comes to this already knowing what's going on, this list is going to be really useful to them. My concern is for those people who aren't already there. And it's funny because I'm having the same conversation with a piece I'm trying to write right now um, where I know exactly what I'm trying to say, but I'm not, you know, my partner who is um, also an educator uh, doing her, her doctorate in education and is a super smart person, not that I'd say it when she could hear me, um, looked at it and said, look, you're not walking me all the way down the garden path with this. You're not giving me the overarching themes that help me connect the pieces together. So one of the things that came out when I looked at this was the reason why this stuff on the internet matters. And for me, one of those important reasons from my perspective is that in publishing, you understand what it means to publish. And one of the most powerful things of, about the internet to me is the fact that in becoming someone who makes something, I, had, I took one run at a really uh, sort of detailed project about five years ago where I had a bunch of 7th and 8th graders build an online textbook about a historical piece and they did all the work from one end to the other. By the end of it, the main, because I don't work in K-12, so for me getting into K-12 is kind of a treat and I don't get to do it very often. The, by far and large, the, the biggest message that I got from those kids coming out was anybody could do this. And it really deconstructed 
the idea of publication and the idea of authority, right? And not in a bad way, but in a way in which it empowered them to be able to to be someone and to be and to build something. And to me, that pulls together stuff like the online identity stuff. It pulls together the authentic audience from the second category. It, and I mean, and you pull the, the, the certain elements, principles that hold the web together. That to me is in there too. That how do you build it and how is it constructed and how can I, how can I have, and pardon the marks here, but how can I control the means of production? How do I actually, how can I build it? How can I put my hands on it? And, and that, the author anywhere thing from the, from the fourth category to me pulls that together too. So when, when I weave all these together and I look for those macro patterns, that's I think going to be really critical to the document being able to speak for itself. Because mm -hmm. while you're there defending the document, this document's going to work great for you. When the document needs to speak for itself, you need to walk them down all the way and take those things that are in your head that pull these things together and start from there. That was my, my sort of main reaction, I, my first reaction. I think a good way to illustrate that would be uh, Michael Wesh's video on rethinking education that he did for Educause last about a year ago, um, which is all about the paradigm shifted in anybody can publish and anyone can publish anywhere. And uh, that's a video that I show to my teachers pretty regularly. And the more I watch it, the more scared I get because I don't know exactly what that means and, and the whole idea of you know there being three transformational changes in how we communicate in human history uh, the first being the the transition to the written word and the second being Gutenberg and the third being this where everybody can publish everybody can have a webcast everybody can can basically compete on equal footing in terms of access to an audience and that having implications for education and for society that we can't really understand yet and so you know that might be a decent way to illustrate that sounds good you mentioned that this is not going to be a handout uh what is it going to be what are you hoping to produce <laughs> i'm not sure um at the moment I, I think it could be it could become a, a, a handout um primarily uh this is an exercise for me to try to um, come to some some larger ideas as uh, Dave alluded to so that I can talk more um, succinctly because administrators don't have much time teachers don't have much time if I could pull this down to two or three bullet points that I could walk in and go you know th this is the big deal um, I think that would um, move me forward more 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 quickly because, because there if also, it's, if it's, there also seems to be some meta potential you know if you can show rather than tell uh, yeah. what you're talking about and actually use some of these funky publishing methods you're talking about maybe that would illustrate the point as well and perhaps we should get to the points do we want to kind of go section by Run section and, yeah good All right, um, so I'll, I'll just kind of read read through these. So the first one, um, life is now both online and offline, and each piece influences the other. Uh, the first year that I did this, I remember watching a um, a webcast um, of an event in Italy, I think it was, and uh, though the guy was speaking in English, and he kept saying, uh, "The web is real. The web is real. The web is real." Um, and uh, I, I had viewed that directly before a conversation that I had been invited to to have with students about um, about internet safety and and uh, and those sort of themes. Um, and what struck out to me was just just that that um, and I think I've seen it even evolve in the last five years is that um, these two these two mediums uh, face to face and online are now um, really more and more seamless um, and and kids are trying to navigate the space at the same time that adults are um, and so uh, when I when I thought about what, what what's the big idea well the big idea is that um, life is digital and analog um, and you can't separate the two uh, and still understand what's going on anymore you, you have to you have to kind of 
wrap your mind around it, even if it's difficult. Um, have conversations and, and learn what it means to have pieces of you um, out there. Dave? <laughs> Um, I just, did you I'm raise your so much, hand? I know I'm feeling. Yes, so he did. <laughs> Blue just brings out the nicest, the nicest side of me. Let me tell you right now. You know, when I look at that web, there's something that I've been using lately in presentations that's really been striking a core, um, and and it's the idea that that online part of that is actually two parts, hmm. because and it it cross sections the argument because there's the people you know and the people you don't know online and they're completely different the rules are different the locations are different everything about it is different so I'll give you an example I'm sitting in front of a bunch of um, the executive student council for the veterinary college here at, at the university and I'm trying to explain to these kids how community can be really cool online how to be a really great way of becoming professionals and making other connections and one of them looks at me and goes we're doing that already we got the Facebook and we know we're getting together with making all of our, you know, when are the meetings and who's got the assignments and all the rest of that. And I said, That's fantastic. But that is completely different than sharing your work with people you don't know. And that, when we talk to administrators particularly about the risks of the internet, and you've got some bits and pieces, you've got some the the protected spaces here, that distinction is for me the always the first one that I use when I talk to administrators and talk with people who don't know it because from there they go oh right the internet is just like real life and then it blows up that distinction because the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. stuff is the online stuff do you know what I mean like right. the lines actually it's four yards over there because the people we know face-to-face -face are the same like it is the same community with Facebook it's not two different ones the different one is the people we don't know online. You know what I mean? So, so the circles, as a, the, so the face people we know circle includes online and not online. And then there's the people I don't know circle. Do you know what I mean? It kind of deconstructs that digital versus analog and is more people I know, people I don't know. I don't know. And that still allows you to talk about safety and security and it doesn't make it about the internet it makes it about people you don't know, which is what it's actually about, right? How do people move? I mean, that gets blurry in itself, right? People that I know versus people that I sort of know or people that I only know. I mean, do I know Jeff? He's right there. Uh, he's right yeah, there. I know. He's, he's the one with the headset. Yeah, good to meet you, Jeff. Too. You know, but at what point do you know somebody you know, do you have to meet them face to face first, or you know, do you take that context online? I, I just don't know where that line is between who I know and who I. Well, it's not a line; know. it's a spectrum, I think, and I think that's part of what needs. You know, your friends on Facebook, you know, that you've never met and don't know who they are, but your your friends. That's part of the spectrum. You go from you know the intimate face to face friends. And our right. intimate online friends, and and I think and, you use different tools for that, right? For me, Facebook is every, almost everybody on Facebook is somebody that I know personally, and probably know outside the context of the online world. But that's certainly not too true on Twitter. And it's know, part of just modern plus. social literacy or etiquette of just being aware of who is hearing and perceiving what you're saying, and. Just being cognizant of that. And what I'm saying is that the rules on Facebook are exactly the same rules as they are in the restaurant down the street. So I don't talk about people that could be overhearing. You don't well, do any except of those if things. you flash the crowd at the restaurant, they're not going to see that forever. Like that's, you know, there are subtle differences. I, I they will know, I see think it if, forever think, if Dave does it. Yeah. I think they would. <laughs> it's, a, it's an event they would never forget. I'll tell you right now. I think that brings up a good, a good distinction though, is that, um, you know, though it's, though it's the same, though, though people I know and people I don't know are, um, are, are convenient things that allow them, allow um, students to make transfer um, their their etiquette understandings from one place to the other, um, or one mode to the other. Um, there are bits of the tool like um, 
Jeff was mentioning, where um, if they don't understand that things are permanent, then and things are, and I don't know, I don't know your your opinion about this, but I I do believe, <laughs> I do believe that uh, the uh, that the that the internet, even the private spaces, aren't really private. Um, and did you guys did you guys ever do anything as a child? Like, did you ever do anything bad as a child? No. Did you ever like no. throw rocks at cars or? <laughs> no. I mean, never. I'll tell you right now, every single bad thing I ever did as a child still comes up at Christmas. I don't know where this real world where people forget about the stupid things you've done is. Because as far as I'm concerned, the real world isn't like that. Nobody ever forgets the stupid things. So, so are you just not acknowledging any qualitative difference in the fact that things online last in a way that's different than the real Yeah, they say, tell the same story, saying, but it's different saying than that I don't. Saying that I don't find this distinction important doesn't mean I don't find any distinctions important. I think that the idea that the things you do in day-to-day -day life that are really dumb are somehow impermanent does not reflect most people's understandings of having done dumb things. But isn't there a difference of degree? I don't think so. I don't think. I mean, it's a difference in terms of your boss, your future boss finding out, maybe. Um, but it, really, in, in the all the hiring discussions I've been in with the managers that I work with and the people that I talk to, one picture of you with a beer in your hand is not going to make the decision about whether or not I hire you. It depends. 57,000 pictures of you with a beer in your hand means you're probably an alcoholic, and I'll probably be able to find that out anyway because what everybody else in your life will know that. What if there's one picture of you with a beer in your hand and it's the only picture of you that's on the internet? Which is the other problem that we see with protecting identities and using aliases and you know trying to keep pictures of yourself offline or uh, you know not having digital footprints all over the place. Yeah, Does but that I mean, make a difference? Yeah, it's the same thing as real life. It's the only thing anybody ever knows about you is the fact that you curse in public. Mm -hmm. it's it's not going to sort of speak well to your possibilities of you that's why people go out and volunteer I mean that's why people do other things in their real life so that they can develop their personality and develop some kind of reputation that will allow them to do other things now we have set reputation schemes in real life they're called resumes and we use them to gather together the things that we've done and we have ways to keep track of those and then we hand them into people whenever we want jobs right we do the same thing with CVs we do all this work so that when somebody says well do you know what you're doing I can go well I've did all this stuff right and to me that's not qualitatively different than all the things that I know about developing those things are the same thing as developing the online now there are differences in the technology brings huge differences into the speed at which things are done so you know where you a same conversation with the same kids in the ABC the other day, the Atlantic Veterinary College. I said, look, the problem with you guys doing the going straight to the net with talking about your profession is that what you might do if you're preparing a magazine article for somebody, all the rigor that you might apply that you need to do because there's a paper publisher out there somewhere who's going to sh shove it back at you if you don't do it, is not in place with the web. So you have to have your own checks and balances that make you think about all of those things that are professionally imposed upon you by the magazine people. They're still there, but as, a, as a, somebody who approaches the internet, you need to know them. And what I'm arguing is that the literacies are the same. It's just that in the print version of that argument, the literacies are embedded in the system so deep that we don't see them all the time. But they're the same ones. They're about rigor. They're about attention to detail. They're about thinking about your reputation. They're about those things. But we need to unpack them as we see them and know them in print and then apply them to the digital. So these people, that whole conversation was about us writing a new policy for the web. And after 45 minutes, I convinced them that all the policies they have already are all that they need. Because being a professional and caring about your work and not doing mean things to people is already part of their existing policy right we already know these things about the world the thing about the net is that it's an awful lot easier to get into trouble quicker right and those those frameworks that we built around our day-to-day our -day space 
aren't there, right? They're not holding you back. So what we need to do is not say, in my mind, again, uh, I can say I think in, in my opinion as many times as you want, but it's, what I think is, is that we already know how to do this stuff. And if we make the distinction between, oh, that's online and that's dangerous and, oh, this is, you know, just in the middle of your classroom, then teachers don't remember and don't understand that they already know they already know how to handle these situations because they have at some level reached a level of professionalism that got them their job and all the rest of those things and they just need to teach those very same things to the students they're not different the way we deal with the people we know is always the way we deal with the people we know the way we deal with the people we don't know is always the way we deal with people we don't know we do not walk up to somebody on the street and hand them our address if we've never met them before right and you don't do that online either well, you don't give your keys. when you comment on a blog post, I, I don't know if I agree with that. Your street address. Do you walk up to random people on the street no, and hand them but I, card I'm card? much more likely to go up to someone and say, oh, or if, if I'm overhearing a conversation, I'm, you know, by, by having that conversation online, it's a public thing as opposed to overhearing right. it in the line. And so I'm much more... You're just creepy if you chime in on, on a conversation in line at the grocery store. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I get your point that, the, the, you know, the basic human courtesies and all are, are really comparable. But I, I think there are differences of the rules but the of differences, the game. The differences are contextual. And the same contextual differences as there is in real life. Like you say, the grocery store is very different than an academic conference. Jump, jumping into a conversation at an academic conference is actually okay because that's what everybody's there for because everybody has a tag and everybody's tag says what membership they have. Same as online. If you guys are all connected through a bunch of different people, those tags tell people who you are. If you walk into, if you go down to the docks here where the fishermen are unloading their fish and I know how to have a conversation with the guy who's unloading them because I was brought up that way and maybe John who is landlocked doesn't understand <laughs> any, of the, any of the lingo right and he doesn't actually he's not able to have that conversation that's not about it being on the internet or not that's about understanding context so the way that you would approach somebody in a blog is not the same way that you would approach them on FARC for instance because FARC.com has its own contextual rules and its language and all those things that are about how they act as a culture it happens to be on the internet, but and it happens to be a culture that could not live anywhere else but the internet because of the way that it cross sections the population. Um, and certainly, there are cultures that live better on the internet the same way that there are cultures that live better in New York City than they live here in Charlottetown. But still, that adapting the context, changing languages, learning the rules, as you state, when you can break into conversation, when you can't, cultural, whether it's online or not. All right, well, we could disagree forever, and we do, uh, but <laughs> Drew. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let, me, let me try to wrap this up, uh, though, to make sure that I understand where, where Dave's coming from. Um, so these things I agree with um, uh, in, in, to some degree. I, I, I haven't thought about them in, entirely as deep as you have. Um, however, um, so literacies are the same, but not built into um, – but most of the time, when we're working with digital uh, media, kids don't understand the context in which they've been placed, so um, or the ramifications of speaking um, in a certain way in a, in one place um, might be um, off. You know, yes. so um, yeah. how do how, how do when when my teachers don't know how to how to understand that. Um, and I could probably say that, to me, some of that's just been built in uh, after I've just been uh, participating in different areas. Um, how do I make that um, transparent? I mean, I tried to make an argument you, a couple of years ago in a paper that said that going into Second Life with your students is fundamentally the same as bringing them to a pig farm. Any kind of trip. I agree with you that they don't know the new context and they don't know how to act. If you were going to bring a bunch of kids to a pig farm, you would spend a lot of time <laughs> discussing things like what you can touch and what you can't touch and what you need to wear. And pigs are big and pigs can be dangerous, strangely, and it will smell funny before you get there. And yes, some of you will find it very hard to smell. And you'll probably spend weeks preparing them for getting to the pig farm. 
a big deal. And there's all this stuff about money and transportation and the whole trip to the pig farm. It's a big deal. It's complicated. There's all kinds of stuff about it. And what we found after 12 months of research is that when you really dig into it, at the end of the day, no different than trying to get them into second life. All these details, there's the money, there's the buzzer, what you can do, what you can't do, but it comes down to the same kind of thing. Problem is, with the internet, like the same example I made with the publishing in the magazine earlier, to publish in the magazine, you would know that it was going to take months of preparation, and you would get the kids set up, and you would take all that time. What we do too often with the internet is go, okay, everybody, let's log in without sort of doing all that other prep work and all that other and, and understanding that that research is going to be there. Sure. You, and you start by listening, you know, in, in, uh, in an online context, right? You don't go to Wikipedia and just start editing stuff because you'll get your head bitten off, right? You go and, and you read stuff and you look at how things are done and you, you sort of feel out the community. You do the same thing with, with blogs. You do the same thing with Twitter. You follow a bunch of people on Twitter before you start posting a bunch of stuff on Twitter. Um, you know, like like going to church, right? You go to a, a new church, you don't start arguing with the preacher during the sermon, right? I bet because Dave that's does. not done in that context. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure Dave's already been banned from all of <laughs> all of the churches on the island. So, but but just learning what those norms are and how that society works or how that you know that group operates is so here's a question one of those literacies right oh, sorry to cut you off John um, so here's a question um, how do teachers learn that I mean I've I've brought that uh, in terms of when when I when a teacher says you know I'm, I'm really interested in uh, trying to blog then we sit down and I say okay so this is this is how blogs work and this is uh, in this situation, you might want to keep it private until your kids are accustomed to, to talking with one another. And then in this situation, you really want to broadcast because it's good. It's good for your kids to be have the have the experience of producing not just for themselves but for a, a wider audience. Um, in what ways can an individual teacher um, come up to speed quickly on important areas of context? pretty subtle business, especially the example that you're using. You know, the distinction between when to post public and, well, one, you and I probably wouldn't agree, and you and John probably wouldn't agree. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, it's, that's that's a subtle one. You know, so for instance, I don't mind it if, if kids post when their spelling's not perfect. And I've talked to 20 teachers who think that is the vilest position they've ever heard. Um, and and that, that's that's just the dividing line. But and to me, the fallback is think your way through it and, and understand. I mean, to some degree, um, I, I get and I, I'm dealing more with faculty now um, than I'm dealing with K-12 teachers. But my response is, look, if you want to play, you're going to actually have to understand this thing that you're trying to do. You can't. It's like teaching somebody how to drive a car without showing them what a road is. And that's, you know, and, and if you're going to learn, you've got to invest the time, right? And it's great to have somebody who can facilitate that uptake. But if they're going to start phasing those people out, um, they're going to have to take the responsibility upon themselves to understand the Internet. And once they can understand the Internet, then they can ask themselves those questions, right? And that's the problem. You know, how, how, I mean, I don't claim to understand the internet. I mean, uh, John certainly understands it as a, at a better level than I do. Um, I know how to break it, um, and I've done that before. <laughs> but I guess that's a step towards knowledge. Just want um, to forward a question from the chat room from Kathy. Uh, Drew, is your school moving toward Common Core? Yes. Um, it's kind of not really off in the distance but um, it's hit our court our curriculum coordinators right now so and what does this mean what is common core what is common core common mm -hmm. core is um, the new uh, national standards um, for different um, curricular areas so in our district our um, our curriculum coordinators are the ones that kind of get hit with it and then they try to understand it and they facilitate conversations with department leaders uh, from all the schools so that they can come to a common understanding of where they're going to head and then they establish curriculum. So yeah, so right now it's it's just hit the coordinators. It hasn't 
um, and it's starting to filter in to those um, teacher level discussions. In the U.S., every state had their own standards prior to Common Core for uh, w basically what they're going to teach in each subject area, and Common Core is an effort to nationalize that, and I believe 47, 48 states are on board with it, um, basically saying, yes, we're going to agree with the national standards so that everybody's teaching the same thing. and. And Kathy just kind of answered one of my questions, but technology apparently is part of Common Core. How so, and in what way does that relate to what you're trying to do here, Drew? Um, could you give me a little bit more background on, on your question, Jeff? <laughs> in other words, what? What I'm trying to do here I, in this conversation? No. Or, like I'm trying to convey certain messages about the use of technology in education. How much does this sync up with what Common Core discusses in technology? Is there this kind of, you know, 21st century literacy or, or the kinds of points you're trying to make? Is that in any way included in Common Core? That's a great question, Kathy. Thanks for sending that into the chat. Um, I know that I've looked at um, the um, American Council of Teachers of Foreign Language. Uh, they have uh, produced sort of a, a common core um, guide. And so I've worked a little bit with that, but I have not worked um, in the other subject areas. So um, it could be that I could find some good information um, that I could distribute um, as I put my thoughts together. Or you Thanks. could find bad information. You know, I don't know. Part Certainly. Of might be the internet is bad, don't use it. No. That's why I come here, right? <laughs> uh, so hmm. we, we've got like 15 minutes are left till the top of the are hour. Are we still on the first <laughs> And we're on the first <laughs> point. <laughs> okay. You, you shouldn't you have like invited me at all, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you wish for when you're asking Ed Tech Weekly for their opinion. <laughs> well, here, I'll, I'll throw out a, a different take, take on it then. Um, so obviously my passion uh, has to do with using the web. Uh, when I work with teachers and um, and and students um, for for a number of ways, uh, but there's still this whole like hardware piece um, that they have these items in their rooms and um, and so one thing that does not show up in these big themes is how all that hardware plays in to um, to the work that that, that they accomplish. So. Any, any ideas about big themes that govern the use of hard, hardware technology in the classroom? You know who's up, Johnny John. Yep. <laughs> it's a very ubiquitous <laughs> invisible, you know, to, to quote Lehman. Um, yeah, the, the, the gadgets are all always there, and there's always a list of stuff that we got to have, right? And my teachers have that list. And, you know, right now it's iPads. we got to have iPads in every room. And last year it was clickers, and the year before that it was smart boards, and the year before that there, there's always something, right? And I've purchased enough technology that I have then subsequently torn out and thrown away to to be very wary of of the fads. And so what I try to do is focus on what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Uh, what are we doing in our classes that requires some different approach? And then what is the technology that best fits that need? Rather than taking the technology, which I, I think we do far too often, and say, uh, let's try to come up with a problem that this can solve because these are really neat. You know, Look at, instead at what are the things that we need to improve the way we're doing? And whether that's you know, addressing student collaboration or creativity or, um, you know, just uh, how we approach teaching particular subjects or project-based learning or student publication or whatever, and looking at, at whatever those goals are and then trying to figure out what the best technology is to support those goals and then letting that drive the hardware decisions. You know, I guess that, that would be the ideal situation. I, I would like to say that that happens in my schools, but uh, I'm more of a realist than that. I, I don't know that that helps at all. No, it does. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, so so I, can, I can leave them with um, that they need to be sure that they uh, articulate the, the specific learning need that they have before selecting some sort of piece of hardware um, as they go forward. Well, yeah, the novelty effect wears off. You know, kids are engaged. Great. 
I know kids are totally engaged with whatever is shiny, but once it has fingerprints on it, they're not engaged anymore. So, you know, what, what is it that, how does this do anything differently? And, and I was at Educon a few weeks ago and there was a panel discussion about sustaining innovation in education. And one of the panelists um, said that, that what we're doing now in 2012 is very similar to what we're doing in 1912, except that we're using technology to do it. And we're using technology to perpetuate pedagogy that we have decided is is no longer relevant so we talk about lecturing being completely inappropriate that we shouldn't be talking at kids for 45 minutes at a time five days a week so what are teachers doing that is innovative they're using a smart board instead of a chalkboard so that you're perpetuating that idea that the teacher needs to stand in front of the room or you're flipping your classroom so that you're taking your lecture and instead of putting your lecture in front of the kids in the class, you're putting the lecture online and making them watch it at home, but you're still lecturing for 45 minutes. So, it, you know, what are we doing that's different? How are we changing uh, our teaching methods to more engage our students? I appreciate you coming back to my theme, John. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know what, and, and the more that this conversation goes on, the more I'm thinking that the answer is, is that all the things you already know are still true. You know, and that's the same thing. Anytime you bring anything fancy that doesn't, you bring a kitten into your classroom. Wow, look at the cute kitten! And then 15 minutes later, uh, the kitten is meowing and is, uh, you know, and that's, you know, if you don't have you know, the technology is terrible. It's the worst conversation because the truth is, is that if you don't make some kind of fancy pitch that says, oh, we need all this technology, you simply won't get it. And then often you end up pitching for technology simply because, uh, pitching a project simply so you can get the technology even though realistically it's probably better done with a pen and paper. Um, and that's that's really hard. And the truth is in terms of buying I think what you said in your thing is it makes perfect sense and what they're gonna get. The simpler the better. Fancy is anything that you need to figure out or maintain and doesn't you know sort of get fixed easily is the sort of thing that's going to cause you pain and misery and grief down the road. Um, and Dave, I kind of want to get back to your stuff. initial point of what is the unifying theme. Uh, and it sounds like your might be, hey, it's all the same. You know, there's not that much difference between online and off. Is there a second part of that sentence or point that you would make? Or have I paraphrased you incorrectly? I think I think you've you've paraphrased me nicely, Jeff. Um, it's it's not so much that there's no difference. It's that the things you know that help you assess things online, uh, things in the face-to-face -face world, will transition to online. So while if if you said to me, um, I don't know, go out and plan for turning Oscar, who's my son, into a figure skater, I don't know anything about making anybody a figure skater. But I know an awful lot about all the other pieces around it, right? So I know about athletics, and I know about dedication, and I know about practice, and those other things that, that I know are necessary. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I know those are the pieces that, are, that go into place. So then after that, there's some stuff about figure skating. <laughs> I don't really know, but I can then go out and research that stuff. So what I don't know is 10% of what I need to start, not 100, right? And I, and I think that that's always the hardest thing for people is they say I don't know the rules on that and then you've got all these crazy experts five names just popped in my head and I almost said them um, who go around and speak to people and say stuff like oh here are the top ten things you absolutely should never do in a blog post like whatever use your common sense and you're fine you know you know we looked at uh, there's some research that went along, and I'm using the same example over and over again, but it was a pretty good chat with those kids from ABC the other day. There's some research they've done across the country. They looked at 77% of the veterinary students in Canada's Facebook accounts. And in it, when you laid out all of the transgressions right, on it, everybody in that room who looked at them went, I can't believe they did that. Right, Every one of them when you talked about them they're like that's ridiculous and that's kind of the message that 
I'm like, we're going to do this whole sort of education piece for first year students when they come in. And essentially the whole education piece is going to be, don't be dumb, right? Because you already know what dumb is. <laughs> so that would be your it. opening paragraph for Drew's <laughs> piece, don't be dumb? Don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. There you go. There's my message. Don't be dumb. <laughs> Ah, the wisdom from EdTech Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> so did you want to uh, bring up any of the specific points left here? Or <laughs> any um, concluding thoughts? Well, I think simplicity and, uh, and sameness is a, is a, a, a resounding theme. Um, are there any other points that I uh, that I that I wrote that you, you disagree with um, that disagree. you'd like to take issue with? Yeah. Oh, I lost the. Oh no, that's not it. Duh. I'll put Where it back in the chat notes? room. Thank you. <laughs> Wonder where that went to. <laughs> okay, I'll put it in the hangout chat. No, 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 I got the chat room. Okay. We're on last thoughts, John. Did, did I just see you pop back in? No, uh, yeah, I did see you pop back in. I know I saw a blur there somewhere. Simplicity is always the trump card. I think that is such an important message. You know, and, and for those of us who've done the complicated stuff from years ago, um, you know what? Get a blog, get a WordPress blog, and don't do anything else. Just stay inside that nice, comfortable <laughs> space where all the upgrades work and everything is all nice and shiny, <laughs> you know. Um, and you know what? Accept accept the ninety percent of your project when it gets online. That's something else I find myself telling people a lot: is you can get ninety percent of what you want for free and easy, and that last ten percent will kill you. Okay, it's a kiss. Yeah. yeah. All right. John, last thoughts? And this was also, do we disagree with anything that he had mentioned? It's a pretty good list. Yeah, I, it I, is. I, it there's is, stuff yeah. I would like to enthusiastically agree with, but I'm <laughs> having trouble disagreeing with it. You can do that too. <laughs> uh, last thoughts, I don't know. You know, if you look at things like Horizon Report, then you're going to get into gaming and data visualization and all of that kind of stuff. But really, it's going to be hard to do that at the teacher level. That, that's more, um, you know, systematic stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know that there's anything really to disagree with or, or even that I would add. Um, collaboration you have in there, um, you know, sharing things online, publishing which we've talked about at, at length here, the blending of online and offline, you know, through, through both, just kind of how we work, the, the immediacy of the technology and just being able to reach out and having a conversation with, with somebody face to face and I can pull someone via text message into that conversation and ask a question, you know, is pretty cool and also becoming increasingly transparent, so. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, and I, you know, I kind of like Dave's idea, shockingly, of, you know, beginning by emphasizing that, you know, this isn't a huge different world and the principles that apply in our face-to-face -face social interactions and educational environments are relevant here. Um, but I, I also, I, I feel like there's a second part of that that I, hasn't totally been articulated yet or maybe got lost in the cloud of articulation. Um, <laughs> uh, something about you know embracing the wow, and and the fact that there is something really special about the the potential of online stuff, and there there are cautions and concerns and balances to be kept in mind, but you know the new normal is still pretty cool, um, and and finding that and and connecting with people for purposes of the professional development and educational collaboration is cool. The last, just one comment on the people are generally helpful bit. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I forget to tell people is that getting into a community 
And again, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Getting into a community online is just like getting into a community face to face. It doesn't happen right away. And I know I've discouraged a lot of people over the years by telling them that they can go out and share with people and people will get back to them and hear back. And the truth is, is they don't always. And it takes a while to get involved in a community. And some communities are really difficult to get into. Um, and if the first one doesn't work, maybe you need to try something else. Um, it's not just because I send you to Classroom 2.0, you might get there and go, ew. Um, that doesn't mean that online communities are ew. It means that the particular tone that's there doesn't necessarily match yours. And I think, well, just like EdTech Talk, I'm sure there are lots of people. <laughs> you know, I, think, it, I think we're a little rambly. Again, it's, it's, all, it's, all like a, it's all like a junior high school cafeteria. You know, there are different lunch tables in the cafeteria, and there are different lunch tables in the online community, and there are different personalities at each lunch table, and there's some who like to talk about themselves and promote themselves a lot, and others who keep quiet, but once in a while they say something really interesting. So I, I take Dave's point that it's all kind of similar. That was recorded, right? right? Yes. But I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> delete that out. Guys, I really appreciate the time. Um, this has helped me uh, think through a few things a little bit more clearly, and uh, I'll be continuing it uh, as I put together things and try to help teachers help teachers continue the, the good work. Very awesome. cool. Thanks and you can share your thoughts out there, internet people. This will be posted on an EdTech Talk where you, commenting is enabled. We had a comment last month. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the web is interactive. And, and Drew's post, I don't know if we mentioned it in the audio, is at drewmcallister.net um, where you can see his blog and read his post. And I think he, it's a blog, so there are comments available, and you can chime <laughs> in there as well and uh, join the conversation that way as well. And there's a public Google Doc that's been updated during this show with words of wisdom <laughs> from John Schenker. I'll go in and change those later. So uh, this has been EdTech Whenever. Uh, <laughs> and I am not going to be available in this time slot for seven weeks. Um, I'm, I, the, the others uh, here might be streaming, so stay tuned, or perhaps we'll find a different time slot to get together, but uh, as always, a pleasure hanging out with my EdTech Whenever peeps. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Nice to meet you, Drew. Nice to meet you too, Dave. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jeff. Happy Leap Week Cheers. to all. Yay! <laughs>